All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We want to welcome everybody to this month's Ledge Action Meeting. Um, Mark had another meeting he had to be at today, so, so we won't pick on Mark today. So, but you, you guys can feel free to text him and pick on him if you want to, so he's because he's not here. But anyway, we'll go ahead and get right into it. Um, I know everybody's got a busy day ahead of them, so we're gonna start with our legislative update and we're gonna go straight to Christopher Scott from Congressman Jay Obernolte's office. Yes, well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you. I wish we were in person, but uh, it's, it's great to see you all. Uh, I just have a few things on my list that we've been focusing on right now. Uh, of course, the congressman is, is addressing and focusing on the turmoil that's going on in Afghanistan, uh, which we're concerned and frustrated, uh, you know, at the response and, you know, that this, this happened. And, of course, saddened that we have U.S. citizens as well as citizens of Afghanistan who are over there who are being threatened, uh, who are being killed. Uh, so we want to keep those uh, in our thoughts and, you know, in our prayers as well. Um, of course, we've spoken on this numerous times, uh, the issues with the illegal marijuana grows. Uh, those are always on the forefront of our mind as it affects our constituents, as you guys know, um, in our most rural uh, parts of our district, but also, you know, in the more populated areas of our district as well. So, uh, you know, we're really requesting the feds to get more involved. Uh, Jay has written two letters now to uh, the attorney general to requesting that they uh, focus and address this issue a little bit more. Uh, the congressman has also been focusing on bringing more funding, uh, more dollars into our district. Uh, so I have a, a couple things on my list, some numbers. So if you want me to uh, email that to you, I'll put my email in the chat uh, and you can let me know if you want those numbers. But uh, so currently um, uh, we secured $11 million for the 8th district, our district, $11 million, which we're very happy about. Our district needs it. Um, this includes $2 million uh, for street improvements to Maple Avenue in Hesperia. Uh, this also includes two million for the Victoria Avenue improvement, imp improvements project in the city of Highland. Uh, additionally, this uh, the, the funds include seven hundred and fifty-seven thousand uh, for road and water infrastructure improve, improvements in Needles. Uh, that also includes nine hundred and sixty thousand for the replenished Big Bear project, uh, aimed at providing a reliable and sustainable local water supply. Uh, this includes eight hundred thousand dollars for Atalanto's wastewater treatment plant. Uh, on top of that, two million for Apple Valley's uh, Desert Knolls wash to reduce erosion through the Lewis Center property and school area. One million for a street and sidewalk improvement project in the city of Bishop, as well as six hundred and sixty-three thousand dollars for the city of Twenty Nine Palms wastewater treatment facility facility. Um, uh, the, their, their plan out there. So we're very happy that we're able to secure that funding. Uh, it really, really uh, helps our district. So, um, you know, we'll keep you uh, updated on any um, additional funding, but thank you so much. All right. Does anybody have any questions for Chris? All right. If you think of something as we're going on, please put them in the chat and we'll pick them up there and we can go back to Chris if something comes up as we're, we're going along. So we will next be moving over to Cassie Vickers, Assemblyman Thurston, Smitty Smith's office. Hi everyone, good morning. I'm Cassie again. Um, so today I'm gonna keep our update pretty short um, and it has to do with the illegal cannabis operations in our district. This is something that I have addressed many times in these meetings and um, other representatives have as well. Um, so I just want to give a little update on what's been going on with those operations. So next January, um, the assemblyman is working with his peers to introduce a few different pieces of legislation to combat this issue. Currently, our office is working with the UC Riverside Environmental Studies Program to study the impact of these grows on the desert environment and water table. The studies in collaboration with the county and law enforcement. Um, this will be one of the bills that we introduce next year. We're also committed to trying to amend Prop 64 to make illegal cultivation from a misdemeanor to a felony. Um, we've also been working with Senator Wilk and Bogue's office on asking California Attorney General Rob Banta and California EPA Secretary Jared Blumenfield to take serious actions on these issues. Um, we know CHP has been trying their best to actively enforce vehicle weight limits and finding probable cost to pull over potential criminals. We need to give CHP more funding 
to be proactive rather than reactionary. Um, so that's all the updates I have for today. Um, I'll put my contact information in the chat and if you have any other follow-up questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you. All right, and thank the assemblyman also because um, as you mentioned that there's a joint letter from him and um, Ochoa Vogue's office on the issues with the uh, Joshua tree that we've talked about the last couple of months. So they did do a um, joint letter out to Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife to, to um, you know, obviously urge them to not make that, put that into the endangered species. So thank you, thank the assemblyman for that. All right, any questions of Cassie? All right, as you can see, um, Chris and Cassie both have put their um, email addresses in there. So if you have something, you can reach out to them also personally um, via that way. Okay, we're gonna move to Kimberly Messon, Supervisor of Paul Cook's office. Good morning, everyone. So I am also gonna to touch briefly on um, illegal marijuana growth. So last week, the Board of Supervisors did pass an urgency ordinance that's gonna increase fines and penalties for those who are operating illegal cannabis grows and also to property owners who are allowing the grows to happen on their property. So uh, currently uh, the ordinance does, the old fees would provide a small 50 to $100 fee. That fee has increased and there is also a per day fee that's included in that. So um, there was an example given at the board that in a given month, give or take, if someone was to receive notices and violations, they get accumulate up to $99,000 in fees. So if that fee is not paid, then the property um, would be put on lend, um, a, um, a hold would be put on the property, and then the MET team would be able to go out there and also um, provide a search warrant. So that was currently passed. Um, I do highly recommend that you watch last week's board meeting and they broke it down. I can also give the example that they give if that's uh, wanted as well, or I can um, email that out too. Something that was also mentioned is that the county is working on an abatement ordinance. Currently, the marijuana enforcement team is only allowed to go in and take the plants. They're not allowed to take down any of the structure that's left, uh, which we see that when the marijuana enforcement team goes in and then takes the plants, you see a new growth come back up a few days, if not a week after, because all the infrastructure is left. So they're working to um, go ahead and change that as well. That way, when they do go in, seize plants, they're also able to take down all the infrastructure so that doesn't happen again. Uh, but we really are trying to make sure that we're not just going after the growers, but also the property owners uh, and really using the property owners to make sure that we can get rid of grows uh, with collaboration with our state and federal partners, the DA's office, the sheriff department. Uh, it has been um, a huge effort and we're slowly starting to see process, progress and we're hoping that that changes. Um, I did wanna emphasize that I know it was mentioned that we were trying to look at a fine that was per plant rather than per day. However, uh, the sheriff's department uh, in discussion with the county decided that a per day fee would be a, a little bit easier to defend um, as far as legality. And then it's also depending of how many plants you have. Certain fees are higher if you have over 200 plants which we tend to see in a more sophisticated grow. And then you have fees that are up to 200 plants, which we tend to see in a backyard grow. A lot of the grows that we tend to see are over that $200, that 200 plant range. So then that dollar amount is higher. Uh, and again, I can provide all this information to you if you'd like me to email it out. Um, and then I do recommend that you look at the, that you watch the board meeting from last week. It has a lot of really good information. Uh, other than that, if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Okay, um, Kimberly, Kimberly, why don't you put your um, email in the chat also? Um, you know, the last, what, three, four meetings, this has been, you know, obviously, I think the voice is being heard um, of the outrage on the marijuana, the legal marijuana plants and the grows. Um, I think there's been a lot of good attention given to that. And then I know I've been in at least three meetings with our district attorney in the last couple of months. And they're hoping, obviously, that going after the owners that are renting or allowing their properties to be used this way will um, assist in that also. So it looks like um, there's a lot of uh, collaboration going on and hopefully making some progress on that. Um, we're going to go ahead and move to our guest speaker, who is Nicholas Schneider from, he's a senior legislative and conservation manager with Mojave Water Agency. Um, another thing that um, has come to myself and to Mark um, a lot lately is water. Um, we hear it on the news, we see it, 
as we drive around or go on vacations and um, you know, where are we going? So we had reached out to Yvonne Cox, who's on this call also and said, hey, we need someone to come and talk to us about water. Our, our peoples are wanting to know where are we going and what does it look like? So Nicholas, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself, it is, it is all yours. Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to address this committee, and um, you'll see me a lot more. Um, so, if you do have questions or or any other issues that come up with water, I will continue to uh, join this action committee because I feel like this is a great place to kind of meet the business community and the water community together. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, really quickly, the Mojave Water Agency we're a we're a water wholesaler, so we don't deliver any water directly to your door, but we do deliver it to your retail agency. So, for example, if you are uh, the city of Victorville or the city of Atalanto, uh, Liberty Utilities, we work directly with them to ensure uh, a, a sustainable water supply throughout the high desert. Our uh, service area is almost 5,000 square miles. We go all the way uh, to Barstow, Red Mountain, over to Phelan, and then we also include uh, the Yucca Valley area. So pretty wide uh, ranging area that we help to manage uh, the groundwater and also water supply. Being a wholesaler, <clears throat> we have the ability to bring water into the area as, a, as new water supply. This would uh, be through access to the California Aqueduct or the State Water Project. Uh, we're the only uh, local agency that has access to that water. So what we do is we take that water and uh, recharge it into the ground, allow that water to percolate into our water table, water basins, and uh, allows us to then um, uh, disseminate that throughout a uh, series of pipelines that we have. Some are uh, non-potable pipelines. One runs the length of the Mojave River uh, into the Newberry Springs area, and one runs into the Morongo Basin uh, via the 247. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a potable water uh, supply system that runs uh, down uh, basically uh, Mesa Street in Hesperia, and it goes all the way through the Victorville area, through Hesperia, and ends around the 395 area. Uh, very recently, we just connected the city of Atalanta to that pipeline, so that's a very successful project to bring a, a new supply, a new clean water supply into the city of Atalanta. So that's just a quick background of who we are, and then uh, kind of answering some of the questions that were posed to us as uh, legislatively. So the state has declared uh, a drought in 50 of the 58 counties throughout the state. Unfortunately, we, well, I say unfortunately in the, uh, for, for, for many reasons, but fortunately we are not one of those counties. So um, all eight of the counties that have not been declared a drought are in the Southern California area. Uh, this is coming after two of the, the, the last two years uh, so this would include 19, or excuse me, 20 and 21, the water years. These are uh, the second driest two-year period on record in California. The only drier period was uh, 1976 and 1977. So we kind of, uh, we've had a dry year like in 2015 when we had the severe drought portion, that was the driest year on record. Uh, and then these two combined are, are kind of up there for uh, a multiple year drought. Um, now, I'm going to shift gears and in, in going from that drought. Locally, we do have a good water supply, but I say that with a caveat. We have water that we've put here for a day like today when we don't have a lot of water moving around in California. We don't have a lot of rain. We're in a drought. Our role here is to manage the groundwater. And so we make sure that there's always enough water supply here by bringing in that water when it's wet. So when we have those big water years, when we have those big wet years like 18 and 19, when we were over in an overabundance of water, we put water into our bank account, into our groundwater aquifer, so that we can then withdraw that water when we have these drier periods. So what we're doing is we're kind of managing those, those different funds and those different amounts of water to ensure that everyone throughout our, our desert has enough water. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't conserve and shouldn't be efficient. Listen, we live in a desert. We are, <laughs> we're, we're, we're very accustomed to living in the hot and the dry. And so we just need to look and continue to live the way we have. 
Since the year 2000, we've reduced our water usage by over 60%. So I just have to continue to encourage everyone to do what you're doing and to continue to conserve and be efficient. New homes are coming in and those homes are coming in very efficient. So on average, we as a community use approximately 100 to 130 gallons per person per day. This includes you going to buy your hamburgers, going to the laundromat, going to Home Depot, going to all of the different things, taking your showers, doing your laundry. That's You account for about 100 to 130 gallons of water per person per day. And so something that we do is we actually look at a what's called an urban water management plan. And, and we recently just put one together that's a 20 year look into our water supply. And we as an agency, we take it even further. We have planned out to the year 2065. So that's a 45 year water look. And with our natural supply, what we would call our return flow or reclaimed water and access to the state water project, this region remains sustainable well past the year 2065. But the only reason we can stay sustainable through this long period of time is if we continue to manage our water continue to be efficient and continue to conserve. On average, we use about 135,000 acre feet of water for the half a million people that live here. So that's, that's a lot of water, but that includes all the agriculture, that includes all the industry, that includes a total of the amount of water use. And so I know acre feet, you may not know how much water that is. That's about 325, well, we'll say 326,000 gallons of water. So it sounds like a lot, but we still need to make sure that we conserve and we still need to make sure that we have a lot of this water into the future. So like I said, the, the way we do this is through what we call groundwater recharge. And you may have seen in the river um, when it kind of looks like, oh my gosh, it's really dry. I haven't seen rain for a while, but there's water in the river. And, and that most of the time comes from us. We have a recharge basin that is in the Deep Creek area so kind of up near what we would call the headwaters of the Mojave River. And we have a facility there where we can uh, inject water into the, into the riverbed, and then it percolates down into the groundwater basin. Um, and I'll kind of use my hands to show you what we end up having is uh, what we call a water mound. And, and it, it goes in by the, by the river, and then it spreads out throughout the whole service area. And it, and it makes a flat water table throughout the whole water table. So, it's concentrated right there by the by the river, but then it, it, it sp spreads out and allows everybody to have access to that water. Okay, <clears throat> and then I'll talk about some of the current things that we're looking at that has been legislation both in the past and in the in kind of moving forward to right now. Um, one of the big things that I helped work on is uh, was SB 200. Uh, this is something that's helping some of our smaller water communities. Um, within our 5,000 square miles, there are 33 what they would consider a small water district. So many of you live in Victorville or you live in My microphone was uh, not working. <laughs> can I get a thumbs up if, I, if you can still hear me? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so we have 33 what they call small water systems. And this is a small water system constitutes anything that is less than 3000 connections or pumps less than 3000 acre feet of water. And, and some of these can be as small as 10 or 15 homes that are all connected to one well. And so you can see how this can be a problem. There's, there's a lot of drought concerns. There's a lot of water supply concerns. And, and so we have a specialized program that we work with them called the small water systems, but we also utilize, um, it's called SAFER, it's the Safe and Affordable Equitable Resiliency Fund for uh, these small water systems. And so I have been on the advisory committee, now we have a representation on this advisory committee to bring this funding into these local water basins. And then something else <clears throat> that I also am working on quite heavily is back in 2018, uh, conservation legislation was signed in the, that was entitled uh, AB 1668 and, and SB 606. These are conservation bills that came out of making conservation a California way of life. 
And, and this is something that is setting up a water budget so that everyone can know how much water they're using in all of the various different water districts. And then we can set a new target for conservation. Many people may have heard of 20 by 2020, which was kind of SBX 7-7 um, was setting a water target for the year 2020, where you had to save at least 20% of your water supply. Well, as a region, I'll, I'll congratulate all you right now. As a region, we saved about 40%. So we doubled the, the, the requirement. We doubled how much we needed to do. But now the state's coming back and they're developing these water budgets. They're developing all the different pieces that we need to do to continue to conserve in the future. So what they're doing is taking four different aspects of, a water, uh, of our water use, and they're giving us a budget based on those four things. So the first thing would be uh, residential water indoor use, uh, residential water outdoor use would be number two, uh, commercial outdoor use, which would be um, any kind of landscaping that is done at a commercial, an institution, or an industrial park. And then the last one is called water loss. So this is all the water that you don't see that gets lost. So any kind of leaks or water theft or whether someone is not metered correctly. So those are all different things that need to be taken into account by the different water agencies. Now, something that we're looking at and we're kind of fighting on this is uh, the current bill is AB 1434. This is the indoor residential um, uh, gallons per capita daily water bill. And what is being done is currently, you may have heard the number 55 gallons per person per day being a, a mandated number. Uh, and so this would include all of your indoor water use. So showers, toilets, um, uh, laundry facilities, dishwashers. Uh, what they're trying to do is take that 55 gallon number, which over the next, by 2030, will be reduced to 50. And what they're trying to do is, is ultimately reduce it to 43. So currently it would take it to 47 and then another slow progression to, to 2030 down to 43 gallons per person per day. So this is something that we're working with the state on. Um, there is a report that got released by uh, the Department of Water Resources that uh, talked about the methodology and how this is working and why this is going to be. Now, I can, I can send out the, the, the report if anybody would like to see it, but right now we're not in favor of AB 1434. And, and this may be something, as it stands right now, it's a two-year bill, so it's not being addressed right now until next year. But we may, as a coalition of local water uh, people here, in, or local legislative people here in the high desert, we may, may want to address that going forward. Uh, and I, Casey, I did see your question. So approximately, we, we use 100 to 130 gallons per person per day. So that that number encompasses a lot of different things. That's not just your indoor water. That also includes the next piece that I'm gonna talk about. So uh, the next piece is what we would refer to as outdoor residential. This is your landscaping. This is any kind of trees you have, grass, whatever you're using outside of your house. So any um, hose faucets, any outside landscaping. And, and the way they calculate this is they actually fly over the whole state with an airplane and they take a, a one foot resolution picture and then they use algorithms to determine how much what they call irrigable acreage you have. So we're a desert, we have larger lots. They give us a lot of credit for outdoor water use because of how big our lots are. Um, I'm gonna just use me, my house as, as an example. I live on approximately an acre and I have uh, a little bit of landscaping in my front yard. So I get credit for whatever is actually there, but I also get credit for what's not there that I could potentially grow. So they're not gonna penalize those agencies or those groups that, are, that have not planted yet, but they also don't want everybody to go out and plant grass on your acre of lawn and your acre of property in the middle of the desert. And so you know, that's something that we in the past have, have sponsored the Cash for Grass program. And now the state is also bringing back the Cash for Grass program um, through some of the drought funding that's coming out. So this, this whole bill package is something that we are kind of working around. There's various working groups that I attend. There's, there's different ways where we can engage and interact with the, the state of California 
to ensure an equitable uh, res re result for here for us here locally. You know, back in 2015, when they blanket mandated us a 25% reduction in water, everybody throughout the whole state got mad. And, and we were especially mad here locally because we had done a really great job of saving water and we had done a really great job of becoming efficient and, con and conserving that water a as i said earlier you know we had saved 40 percent on that 2020 number which is unheard of not very very few uh regions were able to accomplish something as large as that sorry i was reading the question <laughs> I'll, I'll answer that one in a second because i'm not sure i understand what was that did you, Nick, did you see Don Brown's question on the contamination of groundwater? It says, what about the contamination to the groundwater from chemicals that the illegal marijuana growers are using? Would that be considered a felony for poisoning our aquifer? Uh, I'm going to address uh, the cannabis issue at the end. <laughs> so give me, give me one minute. to. I have a couple more notes, a couple more uh, current legislative bills that we're working on. And then, um, and then I'd like to address that because I know Perfect. that's something. I know that's something that's important to everybody. Um, and then one more thing, just real quick on this, uh, the 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 conservation legislation. Something that I'm working on locally is what what we're calling variances. So uh, uh, when we put this water budget together, we're then going to have to, you know, reduce that number. And and if we are um, have already reduced past the point where the state is saying you are now going to be penalized, we can go back and look for variances on, on various things. Since we're more of a rural community, and I know not everywhere here is, is rural, but we do have livestock properties and we are um, in a drier climate. So many people use evaporative cooling. Um, these are two things that we are working on locally here to develop what we, they would call a variance. And so, um, you know, preliminary numbers, your swamp cooler is using about 50 gallons per day. So you'd have to add that into the into the overall mix of all the different pieces that are out there for this water use. And we are working with the state, we're working with UC Davis on, on doing some studies here locally to, to increase the amount of water that we will be able to be budgeted for based on, on our usage. So just kind of know that we're out there fighting, we're out there looking at all this stuff in, in, in terms of this water budget to make sure that we're all gonna be sustainable here locally. And then two more, um, these are state water project bills that we're working on and they're currently in the in the suspense file. So SB 559 is a, is a sub subsidence bill, that's a canal conveyance and uh, subsidence bill for um, rebuilding portions of the state water project. So subsidence is, for those who don't know, um, when we remove water from a water a, a groundwater basin and then the, the ground actually shrinks. And so you have water that kind of fills the void space. And as you remove the water, the, 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 the layer of the ground actually lowers. And so when that happens, it puts stress on infrastructure that's already existing. Um, and what this bill is, is putting together funding to ensure that the uh, state water project can continue to act uh, naturally and can continue to move water from Northern California to Southern California. Uh, a, con uh, a companion bill to that is SB 626, which is the design bid, the build um, uh, bill. And what this would do, it would be allow these projects to go into uh, effect through a design process and then continue to be built as opposed to having to go out to bid and, and continue to rebid as new pieces are coming up. So what these do is actually saves us money here as a state because we're able to work quickly. We're able to, to kind of uh, change things on the fly as opposed to having to stop work rebid and go out and, and look for different solutions to problems. So um, it, it allows the DWR to be more flexible. And DWR is a uh, Department of Water Resources for those of you who don't know. Um, and then um, I think that's, oh, I, I, I wanted to add one more. It's a SB 222. Uh, this is a low income rate assistance program. Um, and so the big issue that we're seeing with this is it's a potential for what they're calling a water tax. Um, so currently the 
author has said that he will not pursue a water tax, but unfortunately he has also not included a funding source into his bill. So um, <clears throat> a lot of the water community is, is uh, concerned or looking into the fact that, that this may be an avenue for uh, future funding sources and it's kind of a backdoor way to get a water tax. So um, again, as a water community, this is something that we're working on with uh, the author as well as a variety of other uh, working groups. So, okay, now I'm gonna, I'm, I'll address the cannabis issue and I will address the uh, water quality issue as well. So I'll, I'll just give you some background. Um, we have been working on this issue for, actually before this was really a cannabis issue. So we work on, on a water theft issue and, and water uh, misuse issue. We've been working on that for many years. We have what, what's called an adjudication here locally. So everyone has a, a water right that you're able to pump. And any one of those people who are pumping outside of that water right is, is in violation of our adjudication. So we are working with a variety of different um, organizations and agencies to help uh, kind of alleviate those those pumping those people who are pumping outside of this judgment. Um, we are working with what is, is known as ACWA, which is the As Association for California Water Agencies. We're also working with CMUA, which is the California M M Municipal Utilities Association. And we're also working with the county. And, and this is all helping to develop legislation, develop regulations. We're also working with the State Water Resource Control Board. Um, we actually have a meeting with uh, one of their members coming up to help um, elevate this in Sacramento so they can understand how this issue is affecting us locally. Not only does this affecting you know, the cities as was mentioned earlier, but these smaller water systems that, that I was talking about are incredibly vulnerable to the fluctuating water supplies because their wells are, are already set, they're at a specific depth, and as these are getting drawn down even further, we have to take into account how to get water to these disadvantaged areas. So of, of our service area, about 65% of our population is what they would consider a disadvantaged community within California. And that's basically a median household income of less than $50,000. And so there's not a lot of funding, there's not a lot of money available within these water districts to redrill a well to, to provide new water supply sources. So this is something that we are working on with those different water districts and with the state of California. So we are also working, we have what we call a water uh, engineer who is working with UC Berkeley to determine how much water these plants are using, how much water these grow sites are using. We have some preliminary numbers from some areas that are actually metered where they're they're tapping into and paying for water in some of these areas. And, and actually just, we know how much water they're using and we know how many plants. So we're getting some really good data. And, and, and you know, we're just kind of in the figuring out how much is going on throughout the whole desert. And so, you know, I'll address the water quality issue. Uh, carbofuron is, is what is being utilized. I'm my background is I was in the pesticide industry before I got into the water industry. So I understand how, how dangerous these are. Um, to answer your question uh, about making it a felony, I believe that the environmental avenue is something that we can tackle and we can utilize at the state level as well as the local level to try to, to put a stop to some of this. So that is um, something where we're pursuing. We have um, support, like I said, through these different organizations that we can get a whole water coalition together. This is this is not just going to be something that we're dealing with here locally. This is something that's been dealt with in Northern California already, and it's going to be continued to be dealt with here locally. So we have options. Um, unfortunately, we're at the end of the legislative year. Um, coming up in January, February is when we can start to introduce some of these new bills. And I think if we can hit the ground running, we really can can you know, kind of tackle some of these issues. And I know it's been something that's been frustrating and we've heard it firsthand at our board meetings, at our special meetings. We actually have um, a whole um, ad hoc committee 
of water districts and, and, and concerned citizens that are coming to meet with us to, to let us know what's going on and come up with solutions. I'd love to take questions. I saw there was one and I didn't see it. Shannon, would you mind reading that one out? Um, we've got the, she was just asking on one of them, was the 100 to 130 per person, the per gallons per day? Correct, per person. It's called what they call a GPCD or gallons per capita daily. Okay, and then we have got a couple more questions. We've got one from Brian Smith that says, um, basically about desalinization, you know, uh, given the fact that we live right here by the ocean, is there any thought push plans for the construction of more desalinization plants for residents? So, um, I want to address de desalination. We're, we're a little bit outside of the window for us locally to take advantage of that, but there has been talk of more inland agencies partnering with desalination agencies um, and, and sort of doing a trade where um, some of the water that comes down the state water project could be traded for, for desalinated water. Um, and, and this hasn't really made it uh, into the planning stages yet, but it is something that has been considered. Um, we're about 90 miles as the crow flies from the, uh, from the ocean and we have a big mountain in, in, in our way. And so that does pose some challenges to, to bringing that water from the ocean. So um, currently that's not really an option for us. Okay, all right. It seems like if they could at least get that, the people on the other side of the mountain, you know, using water that way, it seems like that would be helpful. But I think that's the big question that everybody's always asking. We've got the ocean right there. Um, we've got another question from Yvonne. Nick, can you address the theft of water as it pertains to affecting growth? Yeah, and so when we have, as I, as I stated earlier, this 20 year water look in our urban water management plan, um, th this is how um, say, Hate to use the term, and I don't know if it's if it's frowned upon, but we'll we'll use tapestry, and 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 I'm not taking any opinions on it, one way or the other. But when you come up with a large development such as tapestry, you have to do what's called a water supply assessment, and you have to be able as a developer supply at least 20 per, 20 years of water or have the availability for 20 years of water. And, and this is all done through these urban water management plans. So we do one, um, Hesperia does one, Victorville does one. Anyone who does, who provides more than 3,000 um, acre feet of water or those 3,000 connections has to supply an urban water management plan and then show that the sustainability of their agency. If these <laughs> grow operations are taking more water than we're able to account for in our urban water management plan, then it throws all of our numbers off and we're unable to verify or guarantee a water supply moving forward. And, and if we're not able to tackle this, um, you know, there can be building moratoriums, there can be a lot of things that will really, really affect the economy here locally. Um, you know, back in the late 90s, uh, Yucca Valley experienced a, a moratorium where they weren't able to build, they weren't able to, to provide you know, development and it really, really hurt them economically. They are still in recovery, they are, they are getting stronger and they're, and they're doing much better than they used to do. But I, I don't think as a region, we wanna try to go through that. And so uh, we can try to tackle this and, and, and you know, they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing. They're taking water that, that are, they're not paying for. And so that's something that we have to just take into account and, and try to pursue on a different level to, to stop them from utilizing a resource that we desperately need. Okay, and then we've got a comment from Kim. The DA's office is going to be using environmental law to pursue charges. Um, related to the illegal, illegal grows. That includes water endangered species, waste and dumping. Yeah, and and um, you know, I'll offer Kimberly, we would be happy to help however we can um, with the data that we have, as well as um, you know, any um, water quality reports. We can, we already take water levels, water quality reports from these areas. We have, you know, thousands of water wells that we, we, we manage. So 
we can help you guys if, if you if you reach out to our to our team. Okay, let's see, do we have any other questions? All right. Thank you, Nick. I, you know, we really appreciate that we get these questions every day. Um, we're going to reach out to you to get a recap of what you said so that we can put it, maybe just a, a general recap to put in our newsletter, if that would be okay with you. And um, for those that are unable to attend today, we do um, each week, we do one or each month, we do one um, that says some of the different things. And I think that will be helpful to the people that weren't able to attend the meeting today. Absolutely. And I, I included my email in case anybody has any questions or, or would like some more information. Okay, perfect. Did we have any more um, questions? Let's, let's ask him now while we've got him. All right. Okay. Um, then we're going to, we're going to kind of bring our meeting here to a close. Um, um, I would refer you back to the email that Mark sends out our newsletter. Um, he sent it out on Monday, and it will give you a list of things that we are working on. And Nicholas, I would ask this of you too, to please reach out to us. We are part of a group that's called the Inland Empire Chamber Alliance, and that's a, a group of about 19 chambers. And we look at different legislation and work with our partners um, for our individual regions and or, or at least our cities and counties and the groups that we represent. And that represents a lot of businesses. And we found um, that we've had a, a fair amount of um, success in getting um, you know, our legislative partners or the state um, to actually work with us a little bit. So if there's anything we can do to help you, um, please reach out to Mark and we'll do that. Um, it, like I said, on that newsletter, if you'll take a look, you can look at the IECA and you can see the bills and the different things that we have supported, also what we have opposed. And um, we have been dark for about the last month with the uh, Cal Chamber, but we do start back with that today. And if you go on that link that Mark sends out, you can see the um, 2021 job killer list. And so those are obviously ones that we are in opposition to. We also give you the IECA, the Inland Empire Chamber Alliance website that you can go on and see the work that we're doing through there. And um, just at some other resources. But if there is, let's see, if there's any additional questions, nothing. We had a very good turnout today. Again, these legislative meetings via Zoom have um, been very successful. We were up to 48 people at one point today. So we're gonna give you about 15 minutes back in your day. Thank you everyone for being here. If you have any questions, reach out to Mark and we will um, bring it to our legislative committee and help everybody as, as we can. Have a great Thursday, everyone.